Hey everyone, this is Ryan Cork with Broadcast Buddy TV, the all-around go-to channel for all things broadcast television. And on this channel, it is our goal to equip you with the tips, tricks, and know-hows to help make you a better broadcaster. So if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and hit that bell icon so you never miss an upload. With that being said, today I have a special treat for you guys. We have something, a little concoction that we've made, and I like to call it my commercial break in a box. So let's talk about this in uh, 2020 near the fall we had a certain pandemic kind of wreaking havoc in Pennsylvania which is where we're based uh, there was a lot of ups and downs of whether there was going to even be a high school football season or not and ultimately what they had decided at least uh, our state government was that they were going to allow it, but limit the amount of people who could be there at any you know, given time. So essentially there was gonna be no crowds, there was going to be only the players and the amount of staff needed to do it. Well, that kind of put a wrench in the whole broadcasting aspect of it. So um, with a little bit of tender loving care, we were able to kind of convince them to keep us in the mix and let us go into the field. Now, the problem with this is that they still were limiting the amount of people in the venue and inside any uh, indoor places such as the press box. So we had to be very conscious of how many people and staff that we had on the production crew. One particular thing that made things challenging was we had to limit the number of people we had on the field and in the press box. So what that meant for us is they would only let us have one of our talent in the box and that's it. So what had happened was we actually moved our color commentator out of the press box and we put him on field level down in one of the end zones. We'd set up a table, some monitors, a chair. Now in an attempt to also limit the number of people we had on the field, we had to do away with our red hat. Now for those who don't know, a red hat is a common term for a timeout coordinator. And he's the individual that actually stops play for the game when TV's going to a commercial break. So in lieu of that, the producer actually made up these big cards that we would give to the, uh, give to the color commentator to hold up to signal the referees that we are going to break. There were three cards. There was a green, a yellow, and a red. You know, coming back from break, going to break, 30 seconds back, etc. So that's what we did. And it worked, more or less. We just had to make sure that they could flag down the ref and get their attention. So fast forward to this season, uh, 2020. What are we in? 2021? Yeah. So fast forward to this season here in 2021, we actually uh, had a conversation with the executive producer and he said that he really liked how it worked last year. He wanted to continue doing that, you know, putting the color commentator down on the field and using the cards since he had already bought the cards. And we were like, well, you don't really understand how much more setup that is. You know, if they're allowing us to have both talent in the booth, we might as well do that. Um, but he really didn't want to have a red hat at that point. So had to come up with a solution. That solution was the commercial break in a box. So using the same concept of red, green, yellow, uh, we put together this box that has LEDs, uh, a green and a red and a yellow that can be controlled with the control panel here. And it's all custom built. So essentially what we were doing is we were putting it on the end zone camera, the camera became the operator for it. And as the producer would call for breaks, the camera guy would throw the toggles on the, uh, the box in order to change the colors of the LEDs to indicate that they were what part of the break they were in. We had to kind of build this in a hurry uh, at the beginning of the season. So I was running around doing a whole bunch of other things. So I didn't really get a chance to shoot the footage of the box actually being built. But 
I wanted to go over with you guys in as much detail as I could as far as the schematic and uh, the actual box itself just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this is all put together in case you wanted to do it or tried to do it when you get home. And of course, I will put all of the parts in the description below. Most of them are Amazon with the exception of the two LEDs, which are a little bit more special order. But anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at the box. So it was made out of a Pelican case, the uh, 1120 to be specific. And these LEDs are actually the same kind of LEDs that they equipped onto vehicles, you know, emergency vehicles and things like that. Um, so on the right hand side here of the box, we have a five pin XLR. And we'll actually talk about that more when we look at the schematics of this and uh, what all the pinouts are and everything like that. But essentially it's just uh, individual copper lines running through the cable with some loom on it coming into this little guy. So this is the actual control panel itself and we are only using three of the switches. Uh, the fourth one is currently not wired for anything. But uh, yeah, this, this little control box I found on Amazon. And uh, from there, uh, I actually got this guy here, which is a uh, means to put a cold shoe on like a, a bar or something. And I had this idea so that we could actually mount this to the uh, to the pan bar of the tripod to make it a lot easier for the camera operator who was going to be using it to, you know, control. So the inside of this, if we take a look, it's not overly complicated. So if we take a look here, we have the lines that are coming out of the LED lights coming into a little wire harness that we built, going into a 12 volt battery that is uh, just Velcroed to the bottom there. And to charge it for the first version, um, <laughs> because it didn't have the, the time to really figure this out and then put a relay in or something like that. But essentially what we do to charge it is we just undo the battery from the wiring harness and then we plug it into the uh, battery charger that came with the battery. Well, it didn't come with the battery. We actually, it was separate, but yeah, that's all we do is we plug this in, we charge it. And then when we're ready to use it, we just unplug it and take the uh, battery and attach it back to the wiring harness. And that's it. That's all that's really going on inside the box. You know, we have uh, the wiring harness coming into our five pin XLR and breaking out from power and everything else. And then that is going up into the control panel, which again, plugs in right to the side here. So because the battery is charged, if I were to plug this in, set it up and go to the panel itself, you'll see that there is now power on the control panel and we can now go through this in our sequence of events. Now, this doesn't prevent you from turning on multiple colors at the same time, right? We could do yellow and orange, or yellow and green. Not the cheapest. Um, I think, if I remember, they were probably like $120. Um, maybe the, the single color was a little bit less, but uh, I, I'll figure out what that is and put it in the description below. It's It's now been like, two and a half months since we actually got the parts for this. But uh, yeah, that's that's all the magic. Um, it's just a clever little box that uh, shines lights. So let's go ahead and turn over to the uh, Lucid chart diagram and I'll explain what's actually going on on the inside of this. All right guys, here we are. This is the actual schematic put together for this. Now, keep in mind, uh, a lot of the nomenclature in here and symbols and everything like that probably is not industry standard. I, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I actually don't have any formal training in uh, electrical diagramming, but this was made for me and it's something that I understand. So I'm gonna walk you through my thought process here. Ultimately, what happens is this plug comes into the wiring harness and plugs into the 12 volt battery uh, like we talked about, and that looks like this here. 
right? So there's our battery and that essentially goes right into the plug. And when it's not into the plug, it's plugging into the wall charger. And uh, eventually, you know, if I get a little bit of time, I want to uh, effectively sit down and rewire it so that that's not required, right? Maybe there'll just be a port on the side of the Pelican case that we can plug the charger into and it'll be tied together with, with a relay or something so that it'll just, you know, automatically switch between the battery versus the charger somewhere down the line. So what's happening here? Well, essentially down here we have our LED light, the amber and green, which is one single light. And then we have the one light, which is a red light. In order to get these lights to function effectively, all you need to do is run power from your 12 volt source into the, this lead on the LED light. And then the ground is essentially gets grounded at the uh, battery level. So it's two leads that happen and that's what powers the light. Now, the same thing is happening up here on the amber and green light, but it's a little bit more sophisticated. So it actually has three leads for power. It has uh, mode one, mode two, and mode three. So mode one, when it is receiving power, it is running that to which whatever is programmed to that mode and same with mode two. In which case, ultimately what I'm saying is that the amber and green light have three different particular modes that can be programmed and triggered at any given time. This is used very commonly in, as I said before, emergency vehicles where you would have a controller in the center console that you are throwing on different modes to indicate different types of emergencies, all of which is controlled via the program lead, which you use specifically for changing mode one, mode two, and mode three, and what sequence is happening with those lights and what the pattern is. Uh, like I showed you earlier, we are doing a, you know, kind of three flash strobe, but there's so many different patterns that can be programmed into the modes and how those essentially function, including high powered and low powered mode. So down here, the only additional lead on the red LED is the sync lead. And this is used again in the case where this might be mounted on a uh, police or emergency vehicle and you have multiple lights that need to be in time with each other. So you would actually tie the sync leads together so that they would flash in unison. Now, we are essentially controlling these all independently via different switches on the control panel here. So we are tying the modes directly to the um, five pin XLR. So right, mode one of here, mode two of here, and then this, which I guess you could kind of consider mode three, but those are, are our uh, three leads that we are now extending up into the box, which is going to have our switch, as well as running the positive lead and the ground through the switch as well. And the reason we would even need to do that is because on the box itself, uh, we also are powering the LED lights that are not only in the switches, but also on the box itself, which I don't really have a thing here um, to indicate that. But keep in mind, everything here to this point is internal. And I only really drew this out for my own, you know, sake of sanity. So I knew kind of what was going on and uh, that I understood. But the actual control unit itself looks like this from the back. So we have the, the red lead, the black lead, which is gonna be, of course, your uh, main power and ground, and then the four leads that are going to the switch. We're, uh, we're using that in order to control them independently via switch one, two, three, and four, which we're not using. Now, uh, we absolutely, if you wanna think about it this way, could have used the fourth switch for mode three down here on the LED, the only thing is I would have then had to have a, a six pin XLR. But again, because we're just going with the stoplight mentality, right, red, yellow, green, those were the only three switches that I bothered to wire. So with that in mind, everything comes out of here, goes into the XLR five pin mail, right? So one, two, three, four, five of these get terminated into that from the extended snake, right? So we extend these with copper and bind them together with loom. And on the end, we put that connector on it, which then connects 
directly into the box. But yeah, guys, that's about it. That's all that's going on here. But now, really, the part that you all are interested in is seeing this out in the field. So I did get a chance to shoot footage of this during the season, and I hope you enjoy it. And there you go guys, the commercial break in the box. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Sorry again, I couldn't take you through the step-by-step -step process of building it, but hopefully the live demo is sufficient enough. If you liked the video, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and we'll catch you right here next time on Broadcast Buddy TV.